You good people are at a distinct disadvantage in coming to hear me. First of all, I have no papers, and therefore you never know when I'm going to finish. You could say, oh, he has only three more inches to go. One of the reasons I never use a paper is because I once heard a woman speaking of a sermon of a bishop. She said, glory be to God, after he had read his talk. If he can't remember it, how does he expect us to? <laughs> You're going to hear a subject today that you've never heard before. I'm going to talk about pots, old pots. Have you ever called any person a pot? Sure you have. Do you know that God calls us pots too? That will be the sermon, pots. And I will begin it with a text from St. Paul. It is from his letter to the Corinthians. I heard a reader the other day read the epistle to the Filipinos. instead of the Philippians, and another who read the second letter to the theologians. <laughs> we are no better than pots of earthenware to contain this great treasure. And this proves that such transcendent power does not come from us, but is God's alone. Notice that we have a treasure inside of us, which is grace. Christ's life is in our body. But the body's a pot, like a pot of earthenware. Never before has anyone put, put such a treasure in so trivial a deposit. God doesn't change the nature of our pots when he makes us his children. For example, Moses was called to be the leader of Israel and Moses stuttered. Three times God said to Moses, or Moses said to God, I can't talk, I stutter. And God said to him, well, let your brother Aaron talk for you then but he would not remove the stuttering. That was the nature of his pot. Peter was impetuous, always impetuous. Thomas was lugubrious and sad, always looking for rain on the day of the picnic. God did not change his nature. Paul was a man of fire, rather intolerant. The treasure was put into that pot. And then, if we're ugly, God leaves us ugly. St. Vincent de Paul was a very ugly man. But he contained a great treasure. So let me take you through Scripture and describe God's way of dealing with pots. First of all, where does the treasure come from? Well, the treasure comes from God. And here we go back to the marriage feast of Cana. Our blessed Lord attended this wedding, and there were six water pots, and there were large ones containing 20 or 30 gallons of water. Now, this gives you some idea of how much wine our blessed Lord made. 120 or 180 gallons of wine. Now, the water pots were used by the Jews for purification. They had a peculiar kind of washing. They had to wash their, their uh, hands in such a manner as to let the water drip down their fingers. Then they would rub the palms together. 
And some of these practices were so bound up legally that to break them was considered very serious. Now here we are just before our conversion. We're like these six water pots or before our baptism. And our blessed Lord changes the water into wine. He still keeps the same pot. The steward said they have no wine. Why didn't they have any wine? Why did it all give out? Can you imagine wine giving out in a wine country? And certainly, any father would prepare adequate wine for a wedding ceremony. Why did it give out? Because our blessed Lord brought along all of his disciples. They liked wine then. It was the first case of gate crashing in the history of Christianity. So our blessed Lord leaves the water pots as they are, but changes the water into wine. As the poet Crashaw put it so beautifully, the unconscious waters saw their God and blushed. One would like to write a line of poetry of that kind and die. When God changes our nature, it's very much like, for example, if this marble suddenly began to bloom. That would be something that does not belong to the nature of marble. It would be a supernatural act for marble. If the flowers on the altar of Our Lady suddenly began to walk around the room, that would be a supernatural act for a flower. And if a dog began to quote Shakespeare, that would be something that does not belong to his nature. And if we, who are just creatures of God, just pops, are suddenly endowed with a treasure so that we participate of God's nature as we participate of the nature of our parents, then that's a supernatural act for us. So when, therefore, does the pot get this treasure? It gets it at the moment that the soul receives grace. Now, how much grace and how much treasure do we receive? That depends upon our emptiness. If a box is filled with salt, it can't be filled with pepper. If I am filled with a love of self, I cannot be filled with Christ. Therefore, all spirituality is dependent upon eccentration, getting rid of the ego. Not so much using the word I. And here I take you to another incident of pots. There was a poor old woman in the Old Testament who had two sons who were about to be sold as creditors because she could not pay her debts. And Elisha the prophet came and asked her what she had. She said, all I have is this small pot of oil. Well, Elisha said, send out your sons to the neighborhood and bring in all of the pots that you can find. Then Elisha said to the woman, now begin to pour the oil. Well, the woman began to pour the oil and it didn't stop. And it filled one vessel, one pot, then another pot, and another. And finally she said to her son, hurry, another pot. And, and uh, the son says, there is no other pot. And it stopped. So God pours his grace into us according to our emptiness. And I will tell you later what helps to create that emptiness. This is one of the reasons why some people, for example, do not receive an increase of grace. Why, we're not saints. We have too much of the ego, the I in us. So then we get our grace, our treasure, from God, as exemplified by Cana. We must be empty. 
And then another condition is that sometimes God will put us through trials. And he will do that just in order to bring us closer to him. Now we sometimes think we should never have trials. As a matter of fact, this is part of Christianity. Remember that Christianity began with a defeat. The victory came only at the end. The defeat began with the cross. Our blessed Lord therefore sends us trials. Now here's an example of trial. I will read for you a passage from Jeremiah. And this passage is not just alone about the pot and the treasure, but it is rather about trials that come to different pots. I will first read Jeremiah, and then I will, I will um, explain it to you. And I'm always reading from the uh, New English Bible. In Jeremiah chapter 48, verse 11, all his life long, Moab has lain undisturbed like wine settled on its lees, not emptied from vessel to vessel, he has not gone into exile. Therefore, the taste of him is unaltered and the flavor stays unchanged. What is behind this prophecy of Jeremiah is the description of how wine was made in those days. Grape juice was poured into a vessel. The grape juice settled. The dregs or the lees went to the bottom. The winemaker would then pour the wine into another vessel or pot, leave the dregs in the first vessel. Then he would do it the third, fourth, and fifth time, always leaving the dregs behind. Now God is speaking to Moab, the people of Moab. They were the enemies of the Jews. They would not allow the Israelites, for example, to cross through their land is that a signal for me to quit that bell? No? I never know. They wouldn't, for example, allow the Israelites to cross through their land. Now God is saying, Moab, you people have never had any trial or tribulation. You've never gone into exile like the Jews. And because you've never gone into exile, your wine is unfermented, it's stale, it's sour. Here the scripture indicates that we sometimes will be shifted and our positions will be changed. We may have a checkered career. We may have blessings for a time and then we'll have adversities. All this is to make the more perfect wine. God does not like us to settle down because when we do, our pot becomes full of dregs and leaves. And that brings me to another story about pots. Now suppose I tell you there were 87 examples in scripture, what would you do? Two hours and a half at least it would take, but it's not going to take that long. The next one is also from Jeremiah, and this is a very beautiful one. I love to read this passage. It is um, chapter 18, verse 1. God speaks to this great prophet Jeremiah. And these are the words that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down at once to the potter's house. 
and there I will tell you what I have to say. So I went down to the potter's house and found him working at the wheel. Now and then a vessel he was making out of the clay would be spoiled in his hands. And then he would start again and mold it into another vessel to his liking. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Can I not deal with you, Israel, says the Lord, as the potter deals with clay? You are clay in my hands, like clay in his house of Israel. Now let me explain this. Jeremiah is told to go down to the potter's house. There he found a man at a wheel with clay at a table nearby. The potter has the intent of making a very fine vase. If it's expensive, it's a vase. If it's cheap, it's a vase. He has the intention of making, say, a main vase. And as he plies his finger over the wheel and the clay on it, it breaks and it falls to the ground. Does he leave the clay there? No. He picks it up and he said, well, if I can make a vase, I shall make a vase. And so he makes it into an old pot. Now, God has the intention to make each and every one of us a vase. But we all do not turn out the way he wants us to be. And the way that we very often want to be. Does God reject us? No, he doesn't. He puts us again on the wheel and turns. And he makes us into a lesser vessel. But we are still his. Never despair, therefore, because there has been a failure. God does not let you go. The Father continues to work with you and to turn you into, even though it is a common vessel, one that can still contain the treasure of his grace. And we are very often, when tribulations and trial come, we are to see that we're clay in the hands of the potter. And God is molding us. On the last day, we'll be very grateful, too, that God did take his time in making us better. George Bernard Shaw said, it is too bad that youth was wasted on the young. No, I think it's a good thing that youth was wasted on the young. Because when we get older, we get a little wiser. And God has a better opportunity sometimes of working with his pots. Now we come to the last of the analogies of the pot. This is the story of the woman at the well. The time is high noon. The land is Samaria. Now, Samaria was the ham in a sandwich. The Holy Land was divided into two parts, Judea and Galilee. Judea was on the right side of the tracks. Galilee was on the wrong side of the tracks. When the Babylonians, six centuries before Christ, took over this land, they brought in some of their own people who intermarried with the Jews. And they produced a hybrid race called the Samaritans. Now, the Jews would never have anything to do with the Samaritans. As a matter of fact, 
they would not accept any money for the building of the temple from the Samaritans. Now, I can't give you a better idea than that of how much they must have hated the Samaritans. And the Samaritans, in their turn, when the Jews were in captivity, they would telegraph the dates of the feast by lighting fires on mountaintops. The Samaritans would always light the fires two or three days in advance to confuse the Jews. The Samaritans would throw bones into the temple to desecrate it. So our blessed Lord now comes to this well at high noon, sits down tired, tired. And a woman comes to draw water. Now she should not have been there at noon. No woman in a hot country ever comes at high noon to draw water from a well. There was a reason for it. And our blessed Lord says to her, will you give me to drink? Whenever our Lord wants a favor, he often asks for one. And she said, this well is deep, and you have no pot wherewith to draw. And how is it that you, a Jew, speak to me, a Samaritan? Our Lord said, if you knew who it was who asked you for a drink, you would ask him for the fountain of living water. Our Lord was here describing grace. He was saying, under the analogy of water, that I will give you a kind of an inner spring, a fountain of truth and love. But she couldn't understand that. And our blessed Lord saw that she could not. And he said to her, go tell your husband. She said, I have no husband. Now, Lord said, Thou answerest well, thou hast no husband, for thou hast five. And he with whom thou livest now is not thy husband. Now, that was embarrassing. Now you know why she couldn't come in the morning at night. The women wouldn't let her come. She was an evil woman. He had to come alone at noon. Now that was rather disturbing to the Samaritan woman for a Jew to tell her that. How did he know anyway? Now what would you do if you were at that well and you were in that condition? I know what I would do. I would change the subject. <laughs> Who? What woman, for example, with, with six men wants to talk to a one like our blessed Lord about adultery? So she changed the subject, too. She said, let's talk about theology. Where should we worship? In Jerusalem, as do the Jews, or on the mountaintop, as we Samaritans do? And our Lord said, neither. And he explained about the true worship of the Father. Well, she came to understand him and to know him better. It's interesting the different titles that she gave him in the course of that conversation. First, she called him a Jew. Then she saw that he was a gentleman. She addressed him as sir. Then prophet. Then Messiah, the expected one, the Christ. And when our Lord said to her, when she said, I, I know that Christ is coming, our Lord said, it is I who talks with you. Well, think of what a surprise that was. What does she do? She runs back to the Samaritan village. Incidentally, there are only about 150 Samaritans left in the world, pure Samaritans. She runs back to the Samaritan village. 
And the gospel says she leaves her pot behind. No more need of it. She had waters now. And then she tells the people. And there is some indication in some of the gospel accounts that maybe she told only the men she was going to get even with the women <laughs> because they wouldn't let her come out morning or night. But can't you imagine this woman coming out again to the well with a lot of men flocking after her, all of her boyfriends? And, and they said to her, we believe now, but not because you told us, because we've seen with our own eyes. And the woman called our Lord for the first time in the hearing of the world, Savior, Jew, gentleman, prophet, Messiah, Savior of the world. And applying the lesson now of pots, we have a treasure within us, God's presence, God's grace. It is perfected by trial, by adversities born in his name. But there will come a moment when we'll meet the Lord, as the woman did, and we'll leave the old pot behind. and is put into the grave. But the treasure, the treasure goes to the Lord. And the spirit that goes to the Lord always retains affinity for that body. Because that old pot had something to do with the bearing of trials. It brought us to the communion rail. It united ourselves with the body and blood of Christ. And when, therefore, our spirit is glorified, there will come a day when the body itself will be glorified. You can't put, for example, you put an electric light into a, an alabaster vase, and it will glow. We can see the innocence and divinity sometimes in children. Well, you put divinity into a human nature as it was as was the case with our blessed Lord. His human nature must have glowed as it did at the transfiguration, which must have been a kind of a natural state of our Lord. And so, when we come to the general resurrection, our body is going to be completely transformed, not the same that we have now with all of its imperfections, as the seed is not that which becomes the rose. So our body will be in keeping with the grace that we have received. And my good friends, you've now heard a story, a sermon that you've never heard before on old pots. And may I recommend to you that you allow his fingers to work the clay. Then you'll not spoil his art, and then you'll not spoil your life. And someday, you'll no longer be a pot. You will be a main vase. God love you.